Please remain standing for our scripture reading today. Today our scripture reading comes from the third chapter of the Gospel of John. Chapters, excuse me, verses 1 through 7. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. This is the word of God. Please be seated. So Nicodemus, we are told, is a Pharisee and a leader of the Jews. So we can assume, we know a few things about him based just on this information. First, we know he's well-educated. We know that he's a religious man. We also know, as we're told, that he's a leader among the Jews. So this is someone who has attained a certain level of success in his career. He has status and reputation in his community. And so it's significant that a man this well-respected and recognized doesn't come to Jesus and meet with him in the light of day in public. He comes to him by night, in the dark. He's curious about Jesus. He thinks Jesus is, is, has come from God, that his teachings come from God, that he comes from God. And yet, he comes to him at night, in the dark. He doesn't want everyone to know that he's curious about this man, Jesus, that he's coming to give him his time and his attention. And so he tells Jesus, I think you're from God. Nobody could do the things you're doing unless he was. And Jesus says to him, you have to re be reborn if you want to experience what God has to offer you. You have to be reborn if you want to enter the kingdom. We don't know what Nicodemus says to him after this exchange. We're not given any more words from Nicodemus. We see his confusion. We see Jesus repeating, what's flesh is flesh. What spirit is spirit. You've got to be reborn. Jesus goes on in this passage. It's actually fairly long, this chapter. We have the very familiar scripture verse, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son in 3.16. Jesus goes on beyond that to talk to him about light and dark and how the light has come into the world in Christ, but the world holds on to, clings to the dark. The dark is more comfortable. We can hide in the dark. We aren't as seen in the dark. I think that Nicodemus provides us an excellent example to consider as we move through this Lenten season. He starts, like we all do, in the dark, not understanding, but curious, and wanting to meet and encounter Christ this season. He comes to him in the dark. He doesn't understand what it's going to take to be a part of the story that God is telling the world through Jesus. But I can't leave Nicodemus here. It's not enough. He's here. He's confused. The passage ends. We don't know anything about what Nicodemus is thinking, what he might be saying to people when he leaves, if he talks to his family that night, if he says anything to anyone. We can assume that he goes back to his life, that he's carrying on, but we don't know. But the author of the gospel gives us two more insights into Nicodemus. We see him two more times. 
The first in chapter 7. In chapter 7, Nicodemus is with his colleagues. His colleagues have now become increasingly concerned about who Jesus is, how the community is reacting to him, and they've decided that they need to do something about him. They're calling for his condemnation. They're calling for his arrest. And Nicodemus is there. And we see him in one sentence, having made a change in who he is and what he's about. He says simply to his colleagues, I think we know we have to have a trial. The law says, and we live by the law, we have to have a trial. He has to be heard. We need a hearing before we condemn him, before we convict him. That's all he says. This is a big change from someone who was skulking around in the dark to someone who's at least tentatively making a claim for Jesus. Now, his colleagues, the other leaders, the other Jews in the room, immediately look at him and say, who are you? Are you one of us or are you a Galilean? Are you one of them? And he goes silent again. So he's made a change. He stepped out tentatively for Christ, but he hasn't stepped all the way into the light. Several of the articles I read this week talked about how Nicodemus here is a failed disciple. They call him a failed disciple at this point. I don't like that. I want to defend Nicodemus. I don't think he's a failed disciple. He's clearly not a successful disciple at this point. But he's a disciple in process, right? Hopefully in progress. Hopefully stepping forward. But he started to wrestle with some things. He's moved from the darkness at least tentatively, into a little bit of the light. He's starting to wrestle with who he's always believed himself to be. He's wrestling with his identity as it's been informed by his colleagues, by his position, by his religion, by his education. He's wrestling with those things. How does he reconcile those things with who he knows Christ to be. He's starting to fight the fight. This is something that we all have to do during Lent, I think. He's very much like we are. We start in the dark, curious, wanting to know Christ, seeking Christ. And then we're told we have to be reborn. We have to seek a new identity. We have to let go of the things of the flesh to hold on to, to open our hands to the things of the Spirit. But how do we do that? That's scary stuff. We know the flesh. We know what it means to be a Pharisee. We know what it means to be well-respected in our community. We know what it means to be a mother or a father. We know what it means to be an engineer or a teacher. We know what it means to be a retiree, to be a billionaire. We know what it means to be the things the world tells us that we are. But that's not what Jesus is asking us to do. Jesus is asking us to be reborn, to let those things go, and instead look for rebirth and a new identity, our truest identity as children of God. Now, if we left Nicodemus here, we'd probably be in trouble because he's pretty quickly cowed and silenced by his colleagues. But this isn't the last time we see Nicodemus. We see him again near the end of John in chapter 19. In chapter 19, his colleagues have been successful. Jesus has been arrested, convicted, condemned. He's been crucified, and he's died. And onto the scene walks Joseph of Arimathea. And with him, is the Pharisee Nicodemus. Nicodemus has stepped out of the dark of the night, has fought through the consequences that he's going to have to face if he steps out against his community. And he's with Joseph when he claims the body. So a man who he was too embarrassed to be seen in public to meet with, he's claiming. He's a dead criminal. 
He's claiming the body of a dead criminal. Not only is he there to help claim and bury this body, but we're told that he brings with him a hundred pounds of spices and oils, the things with which you prepare a body for burial. A hundred pounds is a ludicrous, ridiculous, extravagant amount. It's far more than he needs. It's the amount you would bring if perhaps you were burying and honoring a king. Nicodemus has stepped out of the darkness, has wrestled with his identity, and allowed his own rebirth. He's claiming Christ in this moment, not through words. We hear him say nothing, but through his actions. John Wesley says that rebirth requires real, substantial change. It requires transformation, transformation that's evident. I would argue that Nicodemus has pulled this off. The change that we see in Nicodemus is substantial. You know there are consequences to his actions here. You know that he has stepped out in a very risky way. He's all in. Previously, they said, who are you? Are you one of us or one of them? And he was quiet. But now, he's claimed the body of the other, of Jesus of Nazareth, a condemned and dead criminal. He's wrestled with the flesh. He's wrestled with his identity, identity and realized that his identity isn't worth as much as claiming the body of this dead criminal, of claiming Jesus to be his king, his Messiah. You certainly can't argue that he's a failed disciple at this point. He's not a perfect disciple. He's not wholly enlightened. He is, after all, preparing a body for burial. He still doesn't understand what's about to happen, what Jesus has been telling everyone is going to happen. But he's all in. As we move through Lent, I think we're supposed to get to that place so that we're all in, whatever that means for each one of us. I know during Lent, oftentimes, we give up things that are bad for us. And this is always a good thing, right? Give up coffee, give up soda. I always try to go to bed earlier. I try to give myself more rest because I feel like if I have more rest, then I'm in a better place to serve God during my day. I fail every time I stay up late every night. I can't. It's like I can't help myself. Can't help myself. Every morning, just like in your sermon last week, I wake up and think I didn't have enough sleep. Every day. That's how, that's, you know, unfortunately, the, the little battle that I fight every day. But I don't think that's the battle that we're really supposed to engage in during Lent. I think we should still give up the things that are bad for us, and I think we should still embrace the things that are good for us. Reading scripture, doing a, a devotional, participating in a Bible study, enriching our prayer life during Lent. These are all absolutely things we should be doing. But we also need to be seeking that rebirth that God longs to give us. And that means letting go of the identity of, of who the world tells us we are. And this is a harder thing to do. It's a harder thing to let go of than coffee or staying up late. This is real stuff. This is the real stuff of discipleship. There are consequences. You know that Nicodemus faced consequences for what he did that day. His life changed. His earthly life changed, but so did his spiritual life. So did his position to be able to see and witness the kingdom and participate in the kingdom that Christ is ushering into the world. Like I said, he's not a perfect disciple. He's not complete. He's not done. Right? None of us are ever done. Otherwise, we just have to pick which Lent we were doing. I'm doing Lent of 2020, and then I'll be done. Right? We go through Lent every year. We still have more growth to, to accomplish every day. This rebirth is something that happens in us over and over, better and better, hopefully, each time. 
But I think about Nicodemus hearing that the tomb is empty and processing that. And being overjoyed at that. And how much better a position he's in. How much more prepared he's in that morning that he hears that the tomb is empty. Than he was on that night creeping around in the dark. He's let go of a lot of the things that will keep him from fully embracing and fully rejoicing in what has happened in the resurrection. Some point during the week, I found a prayer called the Nicodemus Prayer. And I can't remember where I found it. I didn't write it down. But I'd like to read it to you. It says, God of second chances, God who is patient with our confusion and who leads us into greater understanding, if only we have ears to hear and souls willing to search. Grant that we may be born anew each day into hope, born anew each day into joy, born anew each day into your realm. When we become legalistic in our living, teach us the language of forgiveness. When we become concrete in our thinking, lift us into the ways of your spirit. When we become stuck in patterns that lead us away from you, bring us back to living faith. May your grace become the context of our day. Amen. I pray for you this Lenten season that you wrestle with the things that are keeping you from stepping out into the light, from claiming Christ as your king. If Nicodemus can do it, we can all do it. Just engage in the work. Amen.